Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special edition of our Basel 4 channel. Originally, it was planned to do a Basel 4 channel regarding the topics operational risk and securitization today, but due to special circumstances, we changed our plans. Because on the 23rd of November last week, the EU Commission published a first draft of the revised uh, Capital Requirements Directive, like the CRD5, um, the Capital Requirements Regulation, the CRR2, and the Bank Resolution and Recovery Directive, BRRD. Um, all these three documents will be subject to a uh, consultation with the banking industry and also with the EU Parliament and the Council. The three papers offer a first glance on the regulatory challenges in the year 2017 and many years afterwards because the implementation horizon of Basel IV and all these other regulations will be more or less 2019. The proposed revisions contain three major parts. The first part um, is uh, regarding the finalization of Basel III, which was implemented in the CRR I in 2014, and here especially the introduction of a binding minimum requirement for the leverage ratio, the famous 3%, as well as the net stable funding ratio. Apart from that, we see the first implementations of Basel IV topics, and here we are talking about the so-called fundamental review of the trading book, and the counterparty credit risk, like the new approach for the calculation of exposure at default for derivatives, the SACCR, or how we call it also, the SACA approach. One um, very special and important element in all these proposals are the proportionality uh, that is taken into account in regard to the large number of smaller banks in the European Union. Last but not least, the last third topic is regarding banking uh, resolution and recovery plans, uh, TLEC and MREL. So, um, for starting, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Martin Eisen. I'm a partner at PwC here in Frankfurt, and I'm the Global Basel IV leader. And today, I'm as always, not alone. I have one uh, colleague with me. It's Stefan Röth. Stefan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Röth, senior manager, also with PwC here in Frankfurt, and I lead the uh, national work stream for the standardized approaches of Basel IV. And as Martin already told you, some of those standardized approaches already made their way into the new CRR draft, as we will see in a few slides. Okay, let's have a quick look to the agenda, what we plan today. Of course, we want to cover all the three major parts of the proposals. Um, we will start with the finalization of Basel III, which is the net stable funding ratio and the introduction of the fixed leverage ratio of 3%. Then we will talk about recovery, resolution, the TLEC and the EMRIL requirements. And last but not least, we will have a first glance to the implementation of Basel IV. Okay, before we go into the details, I think it is a good idea to have a quick look uh, to the relation between the CRR, like the European proposals, and um, the current stage of the Basel proposals regarding Basel IV. Um, some of the Basel IV proposals are already finalized on the Basel level, especially when we talk about the SACA approach, securitization, um, the treatment of equity investments in investment funds. The FRGB is also finalized already on Basel level. We have some additional topics which are more focused on Polar 2. Um, here we talk about the interest rate risk in the banking book. And we also have um, Basel, uh, sorry, Pillar 3 topics, um, which means the new disclosure topics. Um, when we talk about the finalization of Basel 3, as we mentioned already before, here we have the finalization of the net stable funding ratio and the leverage ratio. A little bit separate, we have to see the final, finalized rules for the large exposures and also the rules for the total loss absorbing capacity, TLEC, or the European equivalent is EMRIL, minimum requirement for eligible liabilities. When we look to the Basel level, which proposals are not finalized yet, uh, yet um, there we have the standardized approach for credit risk, the IRB approach, the CBA risk capital charge, and also a very important topic, the capital flaws. Apart from that, 
Also, the new standardized approach for operational risk is not finalized yet. We currently expect that the Basel Committee is finalizing the proposals um, in the beginning of December and of November. Uh, and the final papers regarding Basel IV, especially the standards approach for credit risk, IRB approach, uh, capital frauds and CBA will be expected for uh, the beginning of next year, January or maybe in February. Okay, and then I think we should start with the first Basel III topics. Um, here the new CRR introduced a final leverage ratio requirement of 3% based on Tier 1 capital in addition to the risk-weighted assets-based own funds requirement that we already know. Um, this is um, the same requirement that we know already from the Basel proposals. An additional leverage ratio buffer for GSIT, like global significant um, important banks, is still under discussion, both in Basel and on European level. Um, in the meanwhile, of course, the competent authorities uh, still have the possibility to set individual leverage ratio buffers if they think that that is necessary. A binding leverage ratio requirement affects certain well, business models and business segments, especially where they attract relatively low risk-weighted assets, for example, mortgage loans, residential mortgage loans especially. As a reaction uh, to this, that some special um, business models are heavily impacted by the leverage ratio. The EU decided to promote some uh, business models, and here we especially talk about public lending um, that is done by public development banks. Uh, we see uh, pass-through loans and officially guaranteed export credits. They will be excluded from the leverage ratio exposure measurement. This is quite a surprise on European level, uh, but a good surprise for the banks. The new leverage ratio rules um, are also introducing a modified version of the SACCR, the SACA approach, to capture the counterparty credit risk. Like There was always the discussion on how uh, derivatives should be treated in the leverage ratio, especially because in some jurisdictions they are, um, they are on balance sheet, in other jurisdictions they are off balance sheet. In that context, um, an exposure reduction from collateral received is limited only to the variation margin, and the sucker multiplier, we will come to that back later, is set to 1, uh, which eliminates the positive effects from negative market values and over collateralization when there is a netting agreement with one counterparty. Um, this means, of course, for the banks that they have to run two sucker uh, calculations in parallel, one for the risk-weighted assets and the other one for the leverage ratio. In addition to that, the CRR accounts for some open issues brought up by the latest um, Basel consultation paper for the leverage ratio. It is the BCBS 365. In addition, the CRR accounts for some open issues brought up by the latest Basel consultation paper on the leverage ratio, which is um, the BCBS 365. This includes the requirement to capture regular two-way purchases at the trade date and the option to derecognize assets sold on the trade date when the transaction is settled on a delivery versus payment basis. Regarding security financing transactions, SFTs, the CRR clarifies that cash netting is only allowed for trades with an explicit maturity, thus excluding open repos. Where the debit and credit accounts for a client's group are settled daily, transferring the respective balances on a single account, they may be considered on a net basis for leverage ratio purposes. The modifications to the leverage ratio measurement methods require ongoing implementation efforts by banks, definitely. In addition, the introduction of a binding requirement is applicable to all banks, while the newly granted exemptions have limited extent. This increases the importance of the leverage ratio as a major decision-relevant key performance indicator. Yes, Stefan. Would you like to go on with the net stable funding ratio? Of course. 
Let's have a look at the EU proposals for the net stable funding ratio. And here the first important point to notice is that, um, as was expected, the net stable funding ratio becomes a binding minimum requirement for the institutions set at 100% without any transitional provisions. So in the moment that the CRR2 comes into force, institutions will be required to um, keep a net stable funding ratio of at least 100%. Um, also not exactly a big surprise, the EU implementation is in accordance with the requirements by the Basel Committee as published in two papers, BCBS 295 and an FAQ document, BCBS 375. And also, luckily, in most regards, the EU tried to have the definitions for the calculation of the net stable funding ratio to be somewhat similar to those used for the liquidity coverage ratio. There are some exceptions, for example, with regard to asset encumbrance, where we are still not sure whether this was intentional or not. Um, maybe we will see clearer in the next few months. If we look at the rules in some details, you will notice that Article 428, um, which was not especially important in the old CRR, has grown in size to some considerable extent. It introduces the net stable funding ratio as a binding minimum requirement and requires institutions to um, have a net stable funding ratio above 100% all the times. The same formulation as with regard to the liquidity coverage ratio. If the NSFR drops below 100%, institutions are required to formulate a plan how um, this can be restored and send this plan to the supervisory authorities. With regard to available stable funding and required stable funding, there are not so many surprises. One thing that uh, was to be expected after the EBAs consultation um, during this year is that the SACCR for measuring counterparty credit risk is introduced in the net stable funding ratio as well to calculate the expected exposure of derivative liabilities. However, this treatment will be reviewed by the European Union in 2022. So much about the NSFR, but there are yeah, Martin, Stefan, I, yes, I have one question, Stefan. Um, uh, when you look to the, the uh, rules that were proposed by the Basel Committee and now the rules that were proposed by the European Commission, are there any surprises where you would say, okay, that's definitely um, a big change from Basel uh, 3 or from the Basel Committee to the European proposal? One thing, of course, is the use of the SACCR approach, as I just said, which is a major deviation from the Basel rules but uh, not very much surprising given that the EBA had consulted on this topic in the course of 2016. Um, one other issue that I already briefly mentioned is the definition of encumbrance, which differs from the corresponding definition used for the LCR, which I find quite surprising because I would have expected those definitions to go in the same direction to allow a plausibility checks between both reportings um, we will have to see if this will remain in the draft CRR in the near future. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Okay, then um, when we talk about the finalization of Basel III, there are some other changes, smaller changes, but that does not mean that they are not important. Um, starting with the SME factor, the um, risk weight reducing factor for small and medium sized enterprises, or how it's uh, sometimes referred to the Merkel factor. Um, the current CRR contains this small and medium-sized enterprise supporting factor in order to ensure a proper funding for small and medium-sized enterprises, which are seen as one of the most important backbones of the EU economy. Practically, the SME supporting factor leads to a reduction of capital requirements for exposures to SME um, to 76%. 0.19%, which compensates the effects of the capital conservation buffer and aims to keep the total capital requirements for SME exposures constant at 8% as it was before the introduction of the CRR and of Basel III. The draft 
CRR uh, to maintains and even extends the preferential treatment of SME exposures, while the treatment of exposures below 1.5 million euros remains unchanged, as well as the annual turnover criteria. Um, and additional privileged treatment for SME exposures above 1.5 million euros is introduced. Respective claims will be split up in two parts. Um, the first part, exposures up to 1.5 million euros, they receive the supporting factor of 0.0. 7619% and the share of the exposure that exceeds the 1.5 million euros, they receive a supporting factor of 0.85%. An exposure cap for the maximum exposure subject to a privileged treatment is not part of the current CRR2 draft and the supporting factor can be applied to exposure subject to IRB as well as to the credit risk standardized approach. The CRR2 also introduced another supporting factor for positions to finance infrastructure and public services. The preferential treatment of these exposures is introduced in the form also of a supporting factor similar to the SME factor, but uh, this time the factor is 0.75% with a technical uh, application that is uh, quite similar to the one of the SME. Sector. Um, the SM, uh, sorry, the, the finance infrastructure and public service supporting sector is applicable for exposures uh, both in the IRB approach and in the standardized approach for credit risk. Um, the privileged treatment is only possible for uh, some eligible exposures which have to meet several requirements. The proposed treatments of those exposures deviate significantly from the uh, treatment uh, regarding to the Basel Committee, revised standardized, propo standardized approach proposals, where no so, uh, such exposure classification and consequently no such preferential treatment is intended. The next uh, little change, which is also quite important, is in regard to the implementation of IFRS 9. As you might remember, the two previous special editions of our Basel 4 channel was um, in regard to the implications of IRS 9 to regulatory capital ratios. And, and here, especially, the treatment of provisioning uh, will lead to one of the major dependencies between accounting and the calculation of regulatory capital ratios. The CRR2 draft proposes the implementation of a transitional adjustment for the differences between the 12 months expected loss for regulatory purpose and the accounting loss allowances for financial instruments calculated on a lifetime basis over five years to consider the new provisioning in regulatory capital. Um, there was a little bit confusion um, in the first version of the CRR2 regarding the implementation date of this implementation rule, because there the date, um, 1st January of 2019, was mentioned and everybody thought that maybe the endorsement of IRS 9 is postponed. But now in the finally published uh, version of the CR2, uh, we see uh, that the transition rule is quite clear. And also in the meanwhile, in, um, um, in the last week, the endorsement of IRS 9 was, was done by the European Union. So there is definitely a clarification. Um, Stefan, are there some other um, minor changes um, regarding the finalization of Basel III? Yes, indeed, there are. And um, you can see them on the next slide. And they all got to do with uh, the topic of proportionality. For example, with regard to regulatory reporting, uh, small institutions, which are newly defined in the CRR, will only be required to submit some regulatory reports on an annual basis, such uh, reducing the burden of regulatory reporting for those institutions. And um, also the EBA is mandated to deliver a report concerning the cost of regulatory reporting to the EU Commission until the end of 2019. And uh, another a uh, topic here is that some national development banks will be excluded from the CRD5 and therefore also from the CRR requirements. 
Uh, however, this is uh, um, connected with uh, some um, conditions and some requirements, so not uh, each and every development bank should now start to cheer. Uh, better read the text in, in detail before you assess the impact. Um, the topic of proportionality also shows very clearly with regard to disclosure requirements. Here we also have to distinguish in the future between significant institutions, small institutions, and other institutions, and the frequency as well as the amount of information to be disclosed will depend on these uh, three categories, with uh, significant institutions having to publish annual, semi-annual, and quarterly disclosure reports, while small institutions only have to do some selected annual disclosures, while the semi-annual disclosure is limited to a new template of regulatory key metrics. For those in between, uh, called here the other institutions, there is annual and semi-annual disclosure. However, uh, the semi-annual disclosure is also limited to certain key metrics, and there is a further reduction of disclosure requirement for non-listed institutions. Finally, the CRR takes up the topic of investment firms, where it distinguishes between the non-systemic investment firms, which will be excluded from the CRR2 amendments, while so-called systemic investment firms are subject to all the rules which are contained in the amended CRR. And one last change is with regard to financial holding companies. Um, they will be directly supervised entities in the future, correcting some very strange situation where they have been um, the, the mother entities of uh, mixed financial holding company groups, but were not subject to supervision themselves. So here, the, they in the future will have to deal with the supervisors themselves. I uh, wish them a lot of fun. Okay. Um... That was the overview regarding the uh, finalization of Basel III. Um, now we come to the second part of our presentation regarding recovery, resolution, and the Embril and TLEC requirements. Um, here I would like uh, to give an additional hint because I would like to announce that um, the topic re recovery, resolution, and the Embril requirements are quite important topic. Therefore, we plan to conduct a special Basel IV channel on this topic, which will be held um, probably in January next year. But nevertheless, because uh, these new requirements are quite important, I would like to give a first overview about these new requirements. Um, the CRR2 will integrate the TLEC requirements, which have been formulated on an international level for global systematically important institutions in the single rulebook, right, in the CRR. The TLEC requirement is set up for GCs, like these global systematically important institutions only, and will reach a general level of 18% of the risk-weighted assets and 6.75% of the leverage ratio exposure. It will be apply, uh, applicable in 2021 following a two-year transitional period. What is also important is that holdings of TLEC instruments of other GCs have to be deducted from the own TLEC liabilities. The TLEC requirement goes along with an own reporting requirement on at least semi-annual basis. Non-EU GCs will be affected by the CRR implementation as well. Material subsidiaries of non-EU GCs need to comply with an individual minimum requirement corresponding to 90% of the EU GC level if their contribution, contribution to the group exceeds specific thresholds. Meanwhile, the EMREL rules basically remain in the BRRD but are modified uh, significantly. The measurement is aligned with TLEC using risk weighted assets and the leverage ratio exposure as a denominator instead of the total liabilities as we have seen in the original proposals. In contrast to EMREL, uh, sorry, uh, TLEC, EMREL will be set individually for each bank based on the respective resolution plan. It consists of a loss absorption um, amount for all banks 
and a recapitalization amount for those banks that, according to the resolution plan, are not to be wound up in a normal insolvency proceeding. Both loss absorption and recapitalization amount shall not exceed the minimum capital requirements plus the SREP based additional requirement. In addition to this, the Resolution Authority, of course, can impose an emerald guidance in order to cover additional losses or to restore the market confidence in the case of a resolution. The additional guidance for loss absorption is originally allowed, uh, is, sorry, is only allowed if and to the extent a guidance has been set by the competent authority. The market confidence buffer should not exceed the combined buffer requirement, excluding the countercyclical buffer. This is complemented by a flaw consisting of the leverage ratio requirement for loss absorption and recapitalization, respectively. Depending on the resolution plan, this might sum up to um, two times the risk rated assets based minimum requirements, including pillar two requirements, plus the buffers including pillar two guidance and might easily exceed the respective TLEC requirement. Regarding reporting, the new BRD introduces an at least annual reporting requirement for emerald eligible liabilities. The criteria for eligible liabilities are comprehensively established in the new CRR for both TLEC and EMRL and are roughly aligned with the criteria for capital instruments. Accordingly, a repurchase or redemption of eligible instruments will be subject to prior supervisory approval. A point of a non viability clause is explicitly requirement required, sorry, and the liabilities may not be subject to any set off or netting rights. This was not the case in Emerald eligibility liabilities previously and lead to an additional restrictions and information requirements for the respective instruments. In contrast to TLAC, instruments with embedded derivatives are not entirely excluded from Emerald, but limited to the amount that is not affected by the derivative feature. Both Emerald and TLAC are relevant for the de determination of the maximum distribution amount. A lack of eligible liabilities could therefore lead to a severe restriction on the dividend and bonus distribution. Yes, um, that's so far regarding recovery resolution and Emerald and TLEC requirements. Um, and I would like to hand over to Stefan again because he will start with the first implementations of Basel IV topics. Yeah, and so we finally come to the new Basel IV requirements that made their way into the CRR2 draft. And the first and probably most important one of them is the so-called fundamental review of the trading book, the complete overhaul of the existing rules on market risk. This uh, set of new rules has been finalized on the Basel level and therefore is already included in the CRR2. And uh, for a change, we will start this slide on the bottom half and then work our way up because the bottom half of this slide once again shows the huge importance that the EU Commission is putting on the topic of proportionality. Um, we already know the exception for small trading book institutions, which are not subject to uh, market risk capital requirements at all. Um, the corresponding thresholds have been expanded, so a lot more institutions will now be able to profit from this exception. Another threshold has also been introduced, which we have termed the medium-sized trading book. So for all institutions with less than 10% of their uh, assets or below 300 million euros in their trading book will uh, still be able to use the existing standardized approaches for market risk as they are currently in force in the existing CRR and will not have to implement the fundamental review of the trading book at all, therefore allowing them to use less complex methods and um, they are not forced to implement the hugely complex new approaches designed by the Basel Committee. 
for the so-called large trading book institutions, which are above these uh, thresholds, they will have to use the FRTB approaches, either the standardized approach or the internal model approach that we turn to on the next slide. However, for the first three years after the entry into force of the revised CRR and the revised market risk rules, um, they will be allowed to apply a multiplier of 65% to the capital requirements calculated using the FRTB approaches to soften the impact of these new rules on the capital ratios. If we now turn to the upper half of the slide, um, which deals with the so-called sensitivity approach in some more detail, um, you can see that uh, the EU took over most of the rules as proposed by the Battle Committee with only very minor changes some of them, for example, concerning the treatment of covered bonds issued by EU institutions or a sovereign debt of EU governments, EU member states, which um, receive a privileged treatment when calculating the default risk charge. And you can also see, um, as is a common uh, process in the CRR as well as the CRR2, there is a number of mandates for the EBA to uh, write new RTSs and ITSs, for example, on the definition of exotic instruments subject to the residual risk add-on. So much about the standardized approach, but I think Martin has a question. Yes, uh, Stefan, I think um, the introduction of these new thresholds for the calculation of the uh, minimum capital requirements for market risk, that's something um, that is a big difference uh, from the Basel proposal. Um, but I think when we talk about these thresholds, the trading book definition itself becomes even more important because the more assets are assigned to the trading book, the closer the institutions will reach these thresholds. Can you say something about these, um, the, the, the definition of the trading book? And That's a very there good, are some differences a very good point you phrased, yeah. Martin. I'm glad that you've asked the question. Um, indeed, the EU took over most of the new rules on the trading book, banking book boundary as um, proposed by the Basel Committee. However, there are some deviations that may have a major impact on institutions, the most important of which is that the Basel Committee um, in its rules required that all positions which are designated as held for trading be designated to the trading book. The EU has um, enlarged this requirement to cover all assets and liabilities which are accounted for at fair value, therefore also including available for sale and fair value option instruments, which might really increase the trading book of some institutions severely and uh, therefore have a major impact on these thresholds. There are some other changes with regard to uh, investment force as well, but I think this uh, inclusion of all fair value positions in the trading book, which Basel had discussed but decided against, will have a major impact if it really remains in the final CRR2. It will be quite interesting to see during the consultation pro uh, process if that remains in the CRR, and uh, even if um, the EU Commission um, did uh, these changes on purpose or if it's more uh, a, a typo. Um, I think um, it is very important here to mention that the banks have to start analyze as quickly as possible their trading portfolio and especially uh, the new trading book boundary because uh, only then they can um, estimate if they will exceed these thresholds and if they are subject to the new rules of the fundamental review of the trading book or not. But I think um, coming from the standardized approach now to the internal measurement, approach or internal model approach. Um, here we also don't see major deviation from the original uh, Basel III proposals. Um, the most important change um, between the last consultation paper of the fundamental review of the trading book to the final paper in January 2016 concerned the liquidity Horizons, and there we see also deviations between the EU proposals and the proposals of the Basel Committee. Um, I think uh, that's it for the standardized approach. Um, I think now it's time to move on to the internal models approach.
Um, here, also similar to the standards approach, we don't see major changes from the Basel proposals to the EU proposal, but of course there are some, some smaller changes, and these changes um, are especially regarding the liquidity horizons. Um, these uh, liquidity horizons were also a major change between the last consultation paper on FRTB coming from the Basel Committee and the final paper from the Basel Committee. Um, following the last quantitative impact study, the liquidity horizons were reduced notably. This was especially true for the risk factor class credit. In transforming these uh, Basel paper into the CR2, capital requirements for credit risk were reduced further by assigning the central governments and central banks of the EU member states to the 10-day liquidity horizon, which was 20 days in the original Basel paper. In addition, for covered bonds issued by institutions established in the European Union, the liquidity horizon was set to 20 days, which was 40 days in the original Basel paper. Another minor change uh, was privileging some non-Euro-European uh, currencies with respect to the foreign exchange risk. Concerning the non moddable risk factors, which crucially affected the capital requirements reported in the last QIS, the CRR2 provided some more clarification. Apart from committed quotes of third parties and prices of trades, where the institution was one party, only publicly available or verified prices are eligible. Details concerning the requirements on the choice of stress scenarios for non moddable risk factors will be provided in an upcoming um, RTS of the European Banking Authority. It is noteworthy that the freedom in the choice of these stress scenarios contributed uh, to the high variance of the QIS results. The CR2 also sharpens the requirements for models used to calculate the default risk charge to some extent while details are again deferred to an EBA paper. The model is required to use at least two systematic risk factors and use idiosyncratic risk factors specific to the issuer in question. The backtesting requirement and the formula for the capital multiplier are the same as in the Basel paper. However, according to CR2, the multiplier can be reduced if backtesting overshoots are proven not to stem from shortcomings of the bank's market risk model. One key challenge for implementation uh, of the revised internal market model approach stems from the new requirement on the PNL attribution. The CRR2 does not include any details um, and defers also again to an upcoming technical standard drafted by the EBA. Yeah, that's regarding the internal model approach for market risk. And I think now we should go to the next topic, which is counterparty credit risk. Exactly. The second major element of Basel IV that found its way into the CRR2 are the new standardized approach for counterparty credit risk that we've already heard about when talking about the leverage ratio or net stable funding ratio. Once again, the EU took over most of the Basel proposals with only minor changes, for example, asking the EBA to analyze in some more detail the calculation of delta factors for interest rate derivatives or to um, clarify the identification of the primary risk factor, which is another topic that um, yeah, caused some, some um, analysis in the banks doing first SACCR test calculations with respect to more complex or exotic derivatives. What is more interesting, what is new uh, as compared to the Basel requirements, once again, is the topic of proportionality. While the Basel committee strived to uh, implement a single standardized approach, uh, the EU once again decided to make that three approaches, um, one being the full SACCR as proposed in BCBS 2709 by the Basel Committee for institutions with a less derivative business. There is a simplified SACCR, not to be confused with the modified SACCR used in the leverage ratio, and uh, finally the original exposure method is once again contained 
in the CRR craft, so very small institutions will still be allowed to use the original exposure method, which was only marginally modified within the CRR2. Um, talking about counterparty credit risk, um, we also have to turn to the topic of CCP exposures. Here, the EU Commission um, took over the Basel proposals for capital requirements for bank exposures to central counterparties, as stated in the BCBS paper 282. Um, they cover, for example, the calculation of own funds requirements for exposures against qualified central counterparties, as well as the default fund contributions, and in line with um, the proportionality considerations, here also the simplified SACCR may be used as an alternative for the SACCR for smaller institutions. So much about counterparty risk. Next big topic is large exposure. Okay, um, thank you, Stefan. Um, now we come to the topic of large exposures, um, which we covered um, not yet in one of our Basel 4 channels. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's quite important that I would, and that's why I would like to go a little bit more into de uh, to detail today. Um, but I also would like to announce that there will be a special edition on the large exposures in the Basel 4 channel, which may be um, uh, presented in, in February or March next year. Um, the CRR2 proposal contains uh, some significant uh, changes respected uh, to the current large exposure regime, uh, and these changes may lead to both significantly tightened um, large exposure limits, but also to some further operational challenges for institutions. The large exposure definition and the large exposure limits refer in the new CRR2 only to the institution's tier one capital. So it's not permitted any longer to include any kind of tier two capital in the large exposure limit as it's currently the case. Um, apart from the uh, normal 25% large exposure limit, there will be an additional uh, large exposure limit for global systematically important institutions. Um, when they have an exposure against another global uh, systematically important institution, there the large exposure limit will be 15% of their own Tier 1 capital. If in some exceptional cases an um, exposure exceeds the large exposure limit, uh, with the permission, of course, of the competent authority for longer than three months, um, the CRR2 requires from the institutions to report to the authorities a plan for the timely return below um, the large exposure limits. In addition, the EBA shall develop guidelines that specify the exceptional cases, um, the time considered appropriate for returning to compliance and the relevant measures to be taken by the institutions. To to determine the exposure value for derivatives, institutions shall only be allowed to use the new sucker approach, the simplified sucker approach or the original exposure method as applicable, even when they have the permission to make use of the internal model method, the IMM for risk weighted assets purposes. I think that's one of the biggest changes in the large exposure rules because um, the exposures according to the SACCR, the simplified SACCR, or the original exposure method are far higher than according to the internal model method. So um, uh, institutions that were using that method might run into trouble regarding their derivatives exposures. Um, when netting long and short positions in different financial instruments of one client in the trading book institution have to consider their seniority and allocate them to so-called seniority buckets. It is not allowed to offset long and short positions when the short position is more senior than the long position. The CR2 makes clear that institutions shall explicitly take into account exposures arising from derivatives and credit derivatives when calculating the exposure to the issuer of the underlying debt or equity instrument. The EBL 
shall develop a draft technical standard to specify how to determine these indirect exposures arising from derivatives and credit derivatives. The exception from the large exposure limit for trade exposures and default fund contributions to central counterparties will be explicitly limited to qualified central counterparties. The CR2 introduced a new grant traveling provision for exposures to EU central governments, central banks, and public sector entities that are denominated and funded not in a domestic currency, but in the currency of any EU member state. As laid down in Article 495 of the CRR, these exposures will be assigned a risk weight of 0% under the standardized approach for credit risk no longer than uh, 2017. Hence, the last exposure exemption of Article 400 for these exposures would phase out accordingly. However, according to the new provisions of the Article 493, the large exposure limit for these exposures will decrease annually by 25% starting from 100% in 2080 and then going down 25% um, uh, each year. Institutions shall consistently use credit risk mitigation techniques for large exposures purposes when they use them also for risk weighted assets purposes as long as the additional requirement can be met. In cases of financial collateral, regardless of the applied method, institutions have to take into account the collateralized part of the exposure when calculating the exposure to the protection provider. For example, the issue of the financial collateral. Contrary to the view of the Basel Committee, immovable properties are still permitted to be used as credit risk mitigation for large exposure purposes. The large exposure reporting will be amended um, in two major aspects. First, the additional reporting requirement for exposures equal or larger than 300 million euros will be applicable for every institution that has to comply with the CRR large exposure reporting requirements. Furthermore, institutions will have to report their 10 largest exposures to shadow banking entities, where the EBA is asked to develop a technical standard to specify the definition of shadow banking entities. It can be expected that this definition will refer to the definition laid down in the EBA guidelines that we have seen in 2015. Yeah, that's regarding the large exposures. I think it's really a very important topic. Um, therefore, as I mentioned before, there will be another special edition of the Basel 4 channel on this. But um, Stefan, are there maybe some additional changes coming from Basel 4 that we should mention? Yes, indeed, there is one last issue that we have to tackle in this channel, and this is the treatment of equity investments in funds. And the first and maybe even most important change is the definition of funds itself. While so far the specific capital requirements for funds investments were limited to collective investment undertakings, as defined and uh, regulated uh, within the EU. Um, now also so-called unregulated funds, which is so far would have been treated as high-risk positions, come under the treatment of equity investments in uh, funds as proposed by the Basel Committee. Um, the EU Commission takes over both the look-through approach and the mandate-based approach as well as the um, additional add-on of 20% of risk-weighted assets if the look-through is performed by a third party. And in case that none of these approaches can be used, a so-called fallback approach applies with a quite impressive risk rate of 1,250%, which is also applicable to the so-called unregulated funds, which would have attracted a much lower risk rate of only 150% under the current credit risk standardized approach. Um, one last um, sentence on this issue, of course, these new approaches shall be used by banks um, that use either the credit risk standardized approach or the IRB approach. 
and this basically is it about the equity investments in funds according to the CRR2. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan. I think uh, this was the longest Basel IV channel so far, but I think uh, it's important to take time for these very, very important changes, no matter if we refer to the finalization of Basel III, like the leverage ratio finalization or the net table funding ratio, or if we are talking about the TLEC and EMERALD requirements, or last but not least here about the Basel IV changes. Uh, because it will definitely impact uh, banks and especially also their, their business model. I think uh, one last thing that we would like to, to mention uh, in, in this moment is um, that the discussion is still ongoing in the Basel Committee, especially regarding the new standardized approach uh, for credit risk, the IIB approach, and uh, finally also the, the capital floor. Um, nevertheless, the EU shows with this proposal that they definitely plan to adapt to the new proposals from the Basel Committee with some mi uh, minor changes, of course, as we have seen, for example, in the net stable funding ratio. We have seen it also in the market risk regime. There are always some little changes, but in general, they follow the Basel proposals. So, um, therefore, uh, even when we only have seen 50% of Basel IV right now, I'm pretty sure that the EU plans also to implement the rest of Basel IV as soon as the Basel Committee finalized its work on these proposals. Okay, uh, last but not least, I would like to use the possibility to announce the next Basel IV channels. Um, the first one will be on the 16th of December regarding the implications for the regulatory PD and LGD models introduced by the consultation paper of the EBA. And then in the uh, new year, we uh, keep on with our Basel IV channel on the 13th of January, which is Friday the 13th. I hope we, it does not bring us any uh, bad luck. Uh, and that topic will be um, insights into the new approaches for the operational risk and securitization rules. Yeah, um, thank you very much uh, for your attention so far. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was definitely the longest Basel IV channel, but I think it was definitely worth it to stay uh, tuned. Um, if you have any further questions regarding the proposals of the CRR2, do not hesitate to contact me or my colleagues. We will be happy to provide you with some additional support. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.